going to ask uh, Mr. Posey to introduce our guest today. Uh, this is, we found out this is streaming. We got it going all over the state, so we don't have to have this is an education session on chronic wasting disease. So, Mr. Posey, would you introduce our guest speaker? Uh, Okay, thank you so much. Is this working? Okay, perfect. I, I hate to have my back to folks, but um, okay, I'll, majority rules, so I'll just face you guys. All right, so uh, as, as I was introduced, I'm Dr. Jen Ballard. I'm the State Wildlife Veterinarian and Assistant Chief of Research at the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. As a wildlife veterinarian, uh, my specialty is the diagnosis and management of diseases in free-ranging wildlife. And for the last six years, I've used that expertise to lead our state's response and management for chronic wasting disease. And I'm here today to share with you some of the insights we've gained through that experience. Chronic wasting disease uh, is probably the single largest conservation challenge we're facing at this time. It's been detected in 30 states, four Canadian provinces, and the countries of Finland, Sweden, Norway, and South Korea. It has forever changed, very likely, the way we manage free-ranging cervids, not only in the U.S., but pretty much globally. This is a, a new time for cervid management that we all have to step into. I believe that if we are going to effectively manage this disease and if we are going to protect our wildlife resources from the effects of this disease and along with that our hunting heritage, now is the time to establish a science-based management framework to carry us into that future. So I'm going to go through some of the science for that with you today. But before I start talking about chronic wasting disease, I want to talk more fundamentally about wildlife diseases and why we manage them. Because one of the most common questions I get is, should we manage them? Aren't diseases a natural process? Won't the wildlife adapt? Won't this uh, sort of run its course? And I want, to, I want to delve into that because I think it's an important uh, kind of baseline conversation to have as we approach this particular disease. The answer to that question is both yes and no. Of course, diseases and parasites have been part of our ecosystem for a long time, and there are many that our wildlife species are, in fact, adapted to. But the longer we go through the process of wildlife management, the more we learn that um, it's a lot more complicated than that, because not every disease acts the same way. We know that there are diseases that have been in the populations a long time and that uh, our wildlife are adapted to them. Hemorrhagic disease in the southeastern U.S. is a great example of this. But we also know that new diseases are being introduced all the time. They come in by themselves. They come in with invasive species. And they are coming in and being introduced into our wildlife population at a rate that we've never seen before, largely because of globalization. We're moving people and animals and commodities around at a rate never before seen in human history. And with that, we have something we term uh, pathogen pollution. And so we can introduce more pathogens more rapidly than wildlife are able to adapt to. We're also not dealing with the same wildlife populations we were 200 or 100 or even 50 years ago. These populations are surviving in fragmented habitats, compromised habitats, and they are already dealing with a large number of stressors. So new diseases or even old diseases that they previously could adapt to, we may have impaired their ability to do so. We also now recognize that there are certain pathogens that are just fundamentally higher risk because of their own characteristics, and that uh, wildlife populations may not be able to adapt to all diseases because of the nature of those diseases. And research has actually pointed to four characteristics that make a pathogen higher risk for having adverse effects on populations. One is that if it infects multiple hosts. The other is if it creates environmental reservoirs that can be a constant source of disease reintroduction. Frequency disease, uh, dependent disease transmission, I, I can go into that in detail, but I, I won't unless you ask me to. Um, but suffice it to say, some diseases transmit when the population is very dense and they fizzle out as that density gets lower. Other diseases continue to transmit whether it's dense or not dense. 
and those are called frequency dependent diseases and they won't fizzle out just when the population gets smaller and then the last characteristic are diseases that uh, affect reproduction. Now any one of these characteristics would make a pathogen high risk but under certain characteristics what you need to know about CWD is that it can do all four and that makes it a very high risk pathogen that is very difficult even under the best conditions for species to adapt to. And then the last thing I'll note is that successful adaptation does not guarantee maintenance of the status quo. When a wildlife population successfully adapts to a disease, it just means that it doesn't go extinct. But that doesn't mean that it will be the same or that it will return to the same population level. Successful adaptation could permanently change uh, the ecology of the species, the genetics of the species, the way they interact with each other and their environment and the ecosystems that depend on them. So when people tell me that CWD will run its course, I always respond, CWD runs a course. That doesn't mean you like what comes out on the other side because it is not the same and it's not going to be the same. So with all of that information, how do we know when to manage CWD or any disease and when not to manage a disease? We have to filter that down, we have to consider our resources, and we have to think about our priorities. And if you look across the globe at the diseases we choose to actively intervene in with wildlife populations, they typically have one of three characteristics. Either they cause long-term adverse population level effects in our wildlife, they have human health risks, or they pose a risk to livestock, domestic animals, and therefore our food supply. Pretty much every disease that we actively intervene on has one or more of those characteristics. So uh, human health risks, I think our, our nation's rabies uh, program is a really good example of that. And brucellosis and TB are really great examples both of human health risks but also domestic animal health risks. So with regard to chronic wasting disease, why do we manage chronic wasting disease? I, don't want to reinvent the wheel, so I'm going to refer to a publication that's already been uh, released. It's actually from 2016, where Mike Miller, the longtime agency veterinarian for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and John Fisher, the longtime director of the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study at the University of Georgia, published a paper evaluating the first 50 years of what we knew about CWD, and they asked two questions. They basically addressed the issue of, is this worth managing? Is it worth trying? And they said, basically, is it going to affect wildlife populations in the long run? And then they evaluated the science. And they drew the conclusion based on that, that wildlife populations with a high prevalence of CWD were unlikely to thrive. And therefore, it was warranted management. But they also looked at the question of whether it posed a human health risk. And based on the literature, and I'll go into this a little bit more near the end, Based on the literature, they concluded that it is prudent to avoid human exposures to prion diseases. So based on that, uh, the standing dogma in my profession is that CWD is a wildlife disease worth managing. So then let's talk about actually what it is and how we manage it, what our options are. So prion diseases are a very different category of diseases. Most of us are far more familiar with bacteria or fungal infections. Prion diseases don't follow many of the rules that other infectious diseases do. So that changes the way we approach these diseases. Um, it is caused by a misfolded protein. Now the prion protein is a normal component of all mammalian bodies. The body makes it, it sits on the surface of many cells throughout the body, and it does a function that, quite frankly, we don't fully know what that function is, but it seems to perform a function because it's there in the body. Prion diseases occur when that normal protein takes on a new shape. It takes on that shape, it doesn't perform its function anymore, and the body can't break it down because that new conformation is highly, highly resistant to breakdown, both in the body and in the environment. As it accumulates in the body, it actually kills off the neurons in the brain, and that's what leads to the clinical disease and fatality of the, of the illness. So if you think about the old, uh, you know, the, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs commercial, and they were trying to convey that brain cells don't come back, that's why these are considered generally 100% fatal, because once uh, it's accumulated and killed off those neurons, there's no going back. And animals don't do well without their brain cells. Uh, we refer to these as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Transmissible because they can go from one animal to another. Um, there are human versions of uh, TSEs, 
uh, spongiform because as those brain cells die, it leaves holes in the brain that under a microscope look like a sponge. And encephalopathy is just the general word for diseases that cause um, malfunction of the brain, essentially. So um, what, is, what are some of the details of chronic wasting disease we need to know if we're going to manage it? The first is that it has an extremely long incubation period. Now, previously, I used to have to explain what incubation period meant. Post-COVID, I no longer have to explain what that is. So uh, from the time that an animal is infected, it takes a very long time for this to set in. That makes sense if we think about that buildup of prion. That's not a rapid process. Um, but when it, uh, one of the problems with this disease is that fairly early on, within the first few weeks to months, even though they still look perfectly normal, after they've become infected, they start shedding this. And they can shed this for the majority of the time that they have the disease, long before they actually look sick, and they infect other animals in that process. There is no reliable live animal test for chronic wasting disease. The reason being is that the best way to test for the disease is to look at the tissues where the prion starts to accumulate first. I mean, that's going to be your most sensitive. That's the quickest way to pick it up. But we have a hard time reaching those tissues in live animals because they're in the brain stem and they're in a set of lymph nodes that are behind the throat that are pretty hard to get to. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the tissues that we can reach are basically subpar samples. Now, if they test positive, that's great. That's legit. But if they test not detected or, or negative, we don't know if the animal's really negative or if it's just too early in the infection for it to have gotten to those more peripheral tissues. So it's, we use the live animal test as a, a herd-wide screening tool. We uh, use it as a, a research tool, but you can't use it on an individual animal and be like, okay, it's clean, it's good to go. We, we just don't have that kind of confidence in it. There are no treatments. There are no treatments for animal prion diseases. There are no treatments for human prion diseases. We just haven't cracked that egg. And there is no immunity. And that's kind of a quirky thing about these diseases, and it's because it comes from a protein that's a normal part of the body. So the immune system looks at this new shape, and it's causing damage, but it doesn't recognize it as something dangerous. And so it doesn't even attempt to mount an immune response. So um, you know, ideas about trying to boost immunity and boost immune response really aren't effective because it's not an issue of immune competence, it's an issue of immune recognition. And then there is some evidence of genetic resistance, but that is a, a pretty complicated thing, and I actually I kind of want to talk through some of the pros and cons about that. So where this genetic resistance comes from is the gene that codes for the normal protein that's in the body. If there are differences in the animal's normal protein, it can make the animal, it can make those proteins more likely to change their shape, and it can make them less likely to change their shape. Now, um, when CWD, when early days in CWD research, there was a lot of optimism that maybe uh, genetics would be able to fix this because there were animals that seemed more resistant. And they are more resistant. And in scrapie, which is a, a disease of sheep and goats, one gene coded for the majority of the resistance, and you could change one gene and get completely resistant animals. And unfortunately, it just hasn't played out that way with CWD. That same gene um, doesn't confer all that much resistance. It predicts way less of the genetic susceptibility. So these so-called resistant animals can still get the disease. So some of the pros and cons, they are more difficult to infect, but they can become infected. They live longer with it, but that also means they can shed longer and potentially infect more animals before they die. They are selected for. Um, when the disease has been on the landscape uh, for quite a while, we know that they become more common. But the problem with that is, is they were pretty rare beforehand, which means that Mother Nature, in the absence of CWD, was selecting against them. Now CWD is selecting for them, and we have to ask ourselves, what fitness trade-offs come along with that that we haven't recognized yet? Because they were not um, Mother Nature's favorites before this disease. And then uh, it can complicate diagnostic test interpretation as well. And 
one, at least one paper has found that once the, uh, these resistant animals are shedding prions into the environment, there's some subtle strain type differences in what they end up shedding, and that actually can expand the host range. And so we want to make sure that as we push for genetic um, research on this subject, we don't inadvertently um, kind of facilitate the emergence of new prion strains that could have some unintended consequences. So there are people who are doing research on this. Um, so far, they've not been able, the theory now is if that one gene doesn't work, let's see if we can stack multiple genes and get a resistant animal that way. It might work in the future. It hasn't worked yet, so there's no guarantees there. But I think big picture, I think that has a lot more implications for captive cervids than for free-ranging cervids. Because if you can create that, then what? We, we know we can't manipulate the genetics of free-ranging populations. Essentially, you would have to try to eradicate native wildlife herds and replace them. I think we can all agree that the, the ethics of that, the expense, the feasibility, it's, it's all pretty dubious. So um, that may have more implications for other aspects and other, other industries than for the, the management of free-ranging cervids. So after that 16 months is over, and the animal actually starts to look sick, what does it look like? We get progressive weight loss, that's the wasting part. Excessive drinking and urinating, that's actually brain damage causing a form of diabetes. Um, unusual postures, excessive salivation. Eventually they get a lack of awareness and you can nearly walk up to these animals. They just don't know what's going on around them. And then ultimately it is 100% fatal. The clinical signs though are pretty, um, that's a pretty narrow window. They have it for a long time and look normal, and then they die pretty rapidly after they actually get sick. What we find is we have spurts of this um, during really, really hot seasons and really, really cold seasons. It seems like that stress finally pushes them into that clinical stage. So um, you don't see a lot of these. It's a one-off. They're out on the landscape here and there. They're spread out. They're hard to detect. So the fact that we don't see a lot of sick animals can sometimes be misleading for our public that they don't perceive the same problem. The problem is, though, that it never stops. It just happens over and over. It's not seasonal. It doesn't, um, it's not going to stop. It's not going to go away. You may not catch it during the data you collect during hunting season, so it may not change your averages very quickly. So you, you, know, you look at DMAP or other forms of data, and you don't see a change, but it, it's not the right kind of data and the right seasonality to really detect these bigger picture issues. So we know what it does in the individual. We know what it is. Let's talk about how it's transmitted. I already mentioned that it's shed in urine, feces, and saliva. So we know that it can be transmitted directly from deer to deer. Um, bucks and does in any direction. We also know that uh, when a doe has chronic wasting disease, the other members of her family group are far more likely to have the disease and other does in the same vicinity that are not closely genetically related to her are not at the same increased risk. That's pretty important because that tells us, number one, that the social interactions that occur within matrilineal groups may be very important for disease transmission. The other thing is that that tells us is that this disease is going to be very spotty on the landscape. You can have a highly affected family group over here and a less affected family group over there. And if you happen to pick the wrong one when you're doing surveillance, then you can get the wrong impression about what's happening. So this is one of the reasons, this uneven distribution is one of the reasons that chronic wasting disease is a very difficult disease to detect, particularly at a low prevalence. The other thing we know about chronic wasting disease is that bucks tend to have a higher prevalence. That prevalence goes up with age, and bucks are the segment of the population most likely to engage in long distance dispersal movements. So when we focus a lot of our management, we focus it on high risk groups, which would be matrilineal groups around known positive females and bucks, pretty much all bucks, but especially older age class bucks they're going to carry that higher prevalence, and that makes managing this disease very challenging, particularly from a social standpoint, because of course that is the segment of the population that gets a lot of attention from hunters. The, before I move on, I also want to point out the uh, environmental transmission piece. So we have this direct transmission, but the other thing we know is that they can also acquire it from the environment. As the deer are shedding it in the urine, feces, and saliva, it accumulates in the environment and it remains infectious for years. 
many years. We don't actually know the outside limit of how long this prion can remain infectious in the environment. For scrapie, we know it's at least 17 years. So one decade is a very conservative estimate. Two is not outside the realm of possibility at all. We do not know how long it persists, and it may vary uh, by uh, ecosystem and soil types, because we know that the interaction it has with certain soil types does affect its level of um, infectivity. It can bind to clays and become more infectious, and in sandy soils it tends to settle out more quickly, and we know organic uh, acid content may also affect long-term duration. So that's something we're still learning a lot about. It can also be picked up by plants in the soil, making it more bioavailable for grazing and browsing animals. Early in a disease uh, cycle, you'll, probably, you'll see more of this direct transmission as the environmental reservoir builds up. But the longer uh, the disease is in a location, the more environmental tran transmission likely plays a role in the disease. So knowing that, let's talk about what the progress of this disease is. This is an infection curve, basically. Uh, so you've got time here, and you've got the number of cases. And what you'll see is you have this really long lag. Early after the introduction of the disease, the prevalence stays very, very low for a long time. And then it rises very quickly with an exponential growth. So in these early stages, uh, individual animal, animal mortality, it's going to happen, but it's going to be so spread out, you're almost never going to see sick animals. Doesn't mean they weren't there, but you're rarely going to observe them. Deer-to-deer -deer transmission is probably more important at this stage than the environmental transmission. Um, but the environmental uh, reservoir is accumulating at this point. So harvest management is likely to be most effective here. And if you can keep the prevalence low, you can avoid those po adverse population level effects because they are directly related to disease prevalence. So this is the time to manage. This is the time that you can make a difference. When you've detected your very first case in a location, I hate to break your heart, but it wasn't the first case. It's never the first case. The statistical probability of actually finding the very first case in an area is astronomical. You have met a critical mass before you detect the first case. So by the time you detect the first case, you are somewhere up, oh, sorry, hopefully still in here. I, in our state, we found it over here, which was really unfortunate. Um, but you can, if you can jump in and manage early, you'll have a better chance of success. So then when you get to these late stages, you're going to see the disease prevalence start to rise more quickly. You're going to, deer to deer transmission won't stop, but now environmental transmission is likely a, a larger component. Um, the observations of sick and dead animals are going to go up, and it's going to feel very sudden, but it's accumulated over time. And uh, increasing population mortality rates. So we know that basically an average deer without chronic wasting disease should have a 70 to 80% chance of making it to the next year. That's your average survival rate. A deer with CWD in the same environment, same pressures, same likelihood of harvest, all of those things, its chances of surviving is probably is less than 50%, maybe as low as 40%. Now, when that's 5% of your population with a, that has a lower chance of living, your overall population mortality isn't going to change. But when 30% of your population isn't, has a 50-50 shot of making it to the next year, that's going to drive down your total survival. It, it's just a, a math game. Um, so it's going to affect that mortality rate. And I'll tell you, those numbers that I've thrown out, Initially, that came from the state of Wisconsin that had had a long-term study going, but I'll tell you now I'm quoting a research project in our own state. Our state is seeing this. Our state is in certain parts of it, is in this exponential growth curve. We have a prevalence that approaches 30%, and after two years, our preliminary data is showing that it cuts CWD-positive animal survival in half under all the same conditions. It's a big problem. So we, we fight the good fight when we get to this point, but it's hard to make a dent at this point. It's much easier to really try to make progress early, um, but this is where you start to expect to see those negative population effects. So one study I want to touch on, they actually took all the other population studies, and this is multiple species, elk, uh, mule deer, and whitetail, and now there's uh, new studies coming out in whitetail. Um, in Wisconsin and, again, our study. 
But uh, basically what they did is they kind of took all these studies that looked at the effect of CWD on these different populations and they worked with the data to get them to a place where they could compare them and they created this chart. And this chart, so just to orient you a little bit, this is population growth. And one, a flat one, is a stable population. If your population is neither growing nor shrinking, that should be a straight line. If your population's growing, you'll be greater than one, 1.1, 1.2, and if your population is shrinking, you'll be lower than that, uh, less than one. And what they found, this is disease prevalence. So as the CWD prevalence gets to 10%, 20%, 30%, the population growth dips below this line, and that means that at those prevalences, each of these populations begins to decline. Now, is that directly related to CWD? In some cases, yes. In some cases, it's multifactorial because one of the things that CWD can do, even in its mildest form, is it can inhibit population growth. Maybe not cause a direct decline, but inhibit growth. But what that means is if you have other factors that affect the population, a bad hemorrhagic disease year, a bad buffalo gnat year, a flood, a bad winter, um, the ability of that population then to rebound after what should be a short-term effect is inhibited by this disease. And so it can make all those other things worse and kind of magnify those effects. And in some cases, it is the sole sort cause of these uh, declines. So knowing what it can do to our populations, knowing that it warrants management as a wildlife disease, what are our options for management? Well, this is why I showed you this cycle before, because if we want to manage this disease, we have to take what we know about disease transmission and we have to intervene in that cycle and break those trends. So uh, one of the ways that our state addresses dispersal is that we allow the harvest of younger bucks in our CWD area. We have removed our antler point restrictions. We allow the um, checking of a button buck as an antlerless deer, so it's in the same category as a doe, it doesn't count against buck tags, and so the whole goal there was to encourage hunters to harvest younger bucks because they're more likely to do this, uh, to make these long distance dispersals. We can also focus on harvesting more bucks and bringing the age class of our bucks down, which is counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what we've wanted to do for years, but now we're having to face this question of do we want big antlers right now or do we want healthy, stable deer herds in the future? We've never had to choose between those things before. In the presence of CWD, that's actually the choice that we face right now. We can um, take measures that prevent the exchange of disease between family groups. So we can't do a lot about those important social interactions that I talked about earlier that transmit the disease within the family groups. We can try to remove affected family groups. That's our, our best option there. But between family groups is a really interesting issue because there's actually research that shows that when we use artificial food sources, we break down the social structure of white-tailed deer and they are more likely then to interact with members of other matrilineal groups. They, um, the study actually used genetics and they could see a clear structure of genetics Create, uh, to document a clear social structure, and then when they put artificial food sources and did the same study again, that structure was completely gone. So that implies to us that uh, when we use artificial baits and feeds, that congregating of wildlife actually breaks down the social structure and can increase between family group transmission. I already talked a little bit about transmission to, um, to but within the family group. We can't do a lot about it. We can target the affected family groups. And then transmission between bucks and does, and uh, we can't do a lot about that directly, but if we do manage to lower the age class and lower the prevalence within the bucks, then their risk of transmitting it to does when, uh, during the breeding season could go down along with it. And then the environmental reservoir, we don't have anything that we can use to decontaminate prions from the environment at this point, so the best option we have for managing the environmental reservoir is managing the population early to slow down the accumulation of those prions in the environment, because if we're managing the prevalence, then we're managing their shedding. And then also we can avoid congregating animals into areas and creating hot spots of environmental contamination. So fortunately, we don't have to go it alone. 
In 2018, uh, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is of course the umbrella organization for agencies like yours and mine um, and all over the US and Canada, they had uh, the Fish and Wildlife Health Committee compile best management practices for CWD. They compile the science, they summarize it, and they provide recommendations um, in the order from most effective to less effective. And then if you fall off that list, you may not be doing something that's terribly effective at all. Um, it was unanimously adopted by all of the directors of the state and uh, provincial wildlife agencies across the US and Canada. And so I just want to give a couple examples. So in section 1.7, they talk about preventing the unnatural congregation of cervids. The best, or the best recommendation they would make would be to eliminate baiting and feeding of all wild cervids. That's the highest level, best option. The next thing you can do would be to allow baiting, uh, allow baiting and feeding only in areas where the disease does not occur. You know, you're adding a little risk because it's hard to detect, so it may be occurring somewhere we don't know about, but it's a compromise. It's the next step down. For states that don't have it, um, beginning the process of decreasing the use of baits and feeds before it gets there can help to reduce some of these social obstacles. And then providing alternative methodologies for using cameras. Hunters really like using cameras. And when they evaluated the science, what they found is that that was going to be a major barrier. Maybe they would agree to not hunt over bait and feed. Maybe they'd agree not to use bait and feed for other things, but they still wanted to use their cameras. So finding a way and putting out information for hunters that would encourage them to use their cameras effectively without using baits and feeds was one of the recommendations of the group. Another uh, section, and of course, I, this is available online. It's in its entirety. I've just pulled out a few uh, suggestions that um, we leaned into most in our state as best we could. So in managing prevalence, um, working with epidemiologists to monitor strategies. So surveillance is about detecting the disease where we don't know it, for it occurs. Monitoring is about watching the prevalence in areas where it does occur to see if we're being effective in our management. So ha having a monitoring strategy straight out of the gate is very important, but then also utilizing harvest and other removal. That's, that's kind of what it gets down to at this point. And I kind of touched on this a little bit, but targeting the portion of the population most likely to have CWD, targeting animals in known CWD hotspots, uh, targeting the time of removal to most effectively remove an infected animals, this is uh, sort of based on a theory that late season harvest may disproportionately remove affected animals. They get more run down more quickly, and so you may end up removing um, particularly affected bucks a little bit later in the season after the does have been bred so you don't affect reproduction. And then reducing cervid density in CWD positive areas with high density populations. Um, we kind of touched on this being more frequency dependent than density dependent, um, but there's if you're overpopulated, you're still not doing yourself any favors. And there's also research that shows that natural um, movement of deer out of high prevalence, or uh, sorry, out of high density areas is naturally slower. So those dispersal movements happen less frequently if the population is less dense. So that's uh, kind of, it kind of goes at it from a couple of angles. They also recommend reducing environmental contamination by reducing uh, artificial congregation utilizing a coordinated and adaptive approach. So basically what they're saying is we need to work, we need to monitor, and if new science comes out, we shouldn't be afraid to update our methods. Um, so we, we want to make sure we're keeping a good eye on what's happening, but we want to also be flexible enough to adapt to the new science as it comes out, and we want to be contributing to that science as best we can. And then, um, implementing regulations to prevent the movement of carcasses. So thinking about what we talked about earlier, the prion, the infectious prion is spread throughout the body. Once a, an infected carcass, even the unwanted parts, is deposited in the environment, that location will be contaminated for years to come after this. And so the human facilitated <laughs> movement of carcasses is one of our major risk points for an introduction into the environment. So that's a lot. There's a lot there. There's a lot more in the best management practices. So this is the summary table that I give my commission. And it's, I really like to break it out into three categories because a lot of times we like to take CWD management like an a la carte menu. We want to take the pieces that taste good. We want to take what's palatable. And we want to leave the rest in the kitchen. But it's not an a la carte menu. 
It's an all-you-can-eat buffet. I, you want to take as many of these as possible. You want to go back for seconds and put a little bit in your purse on the way out the door. Because if you really understand the significance of CWD and what it can do to your population, then you will know that you want to do everything you can to address this as quickly as possible. So some of the things we can do to slow the spread, and I've kind of talked about the biology behind it, lowering population densities um, to slow down natural dispersal, harvesting younger bucks because they're the ones that are likely to do the dispersing, um, proper disposal of carcasses, so slowing the human facilitated spread, and using lures and scents, or avoiding using lures and scents that contain urine and other products that can be contaminated with prions, and avoiding the translocation of deer, including rehabilitation. Now, we don't have a lot of captive cervids in our state, but we did prohibit rehabilitation after, um, after the detection of CWD statewide. Because if you think about it, a little deer fawn looks cute, looks healthy. We can't test it. We can't treat it. We now know that fawns can actually be born with CWD if their mother's infected. We've documented in utero transmission. And one fawn going to a rehab facility can look perfectly normal, be released, get sick and die months later, but that environment is now contaminated. That rehabilitation environment is now contaminated to infect future fawns for years, decades to come. So, um, it, this also, of course, has implications for live cervid trade uh, in other areas that we in our state haven't addressed, but I, I think those are pretty well known. We don't want to make it worse. So if we do things to slow it down, if we do things to try to make it better, but on the other hand, we're still doing things that we know make it worse, it's self-defeating. So the things that we do to make it worse is we congregate cervids for viewing, for hunting, and we also um, we implement management strategies that maximize the segment of the population that has the highest disease prevalence. And that's going to drive up transmission. So in the presence of CWD, we want to avoid those management strategies. And then to make it better, the two things that are proposed in the scientific literature at this point that can make, and by make it better, I mean suppress disease prevalence and avoid the long-term population effects. We're not going to eradicate this disease with very rare or few examples that is not a, a feasible goal. So I want to define what the goal is, is to suppress prevalence and hold off the adverse population level effects. The only two proposed uh, methods for that at this time are all age class male focused harvest and the selective removal of high risk social groups. Um, Illinois has done some great work. Uh, you can look at it. Illinois and Wisconsin found CWD about the same time. And they both started out with culling efforts, and Wisconsin stopped. And Illinois continued, but very, not broad scale, very honed in on affected areas and removing those affected social groups. And they have managed to suppress their disease prevalence while Wisconsin has gone absolutely through the roof. There are, are places in Wisconsin where 50% of the bucks have CWD. So those are our only two options. I hope in the future that we will have new options, but we will only have new options if states like yours and mine participate in the research to help develop uh, new management options and to test them out. So obviously, when I'm talking to my public, I don't throw up all of that BMPs and huge slides. You guys need to know that. But how do we boil this down to something that's actionable and understandable and easy for our hunting public? So this is the slide I usually give at the end of all of my public presentations about CWD. We tell them to keep hunting. We can't manage this disease without our hunters, and we need to be straightforward about that. We tell them to get their deer tested. Our state has at least one freezer, often more, in every single county in the state. And we will test any deer that a hunter brings to us from the first day of the season to the last, no matter whether our quotas have been hit, no matter why they want it tested, or no matter what age it is. We will test them all. It aids our surveillance, but I also think of it as a retention strategy because if they're uncomfortable about CWD and they don't have an option for testing, it could affect their long-term participation. So I think about it with sort of both hats. 
We have, um, we talked to him about carcass transportation. We have rules about that, but rules don't protect our herds if people don't follow them. So we really want to talk about the importance of adhering to the carcass movement restrictions that we have. And then also we have a, a way that hunters can report sick or found, or not just hunters, any member of the public can report sick or found dead deer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have county specific contacts. And we investigate those because we know that they are the single most useful sample that we can acquire in our surveillance strategy. So let's talk for a moment about CWD and public health. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is not a public health agency, and although all veterinarians in the country are trained in public health, I am not a public health official. So what I will convey to you is the recommendations of public health officials who have looked at this issue. So to date, there are no confirmed cases of CWD affecting a human. That's great news, and we want it to stay that way. That is huge. The problem is that the research on whether it could ever happen is very, very mixed. And by mixed, I mean there's literally two studies in macaques, the highest level primate that you can do uh, infectious disease work in. And in one study, they found no transmission, and in the other study, they found transmission. What do you do with that? How do you explain that to the public? From a scientific standpoint, it probably comes down to how they were exposed, how much they got, and the strain type they were exposed to, or other factors in the monkeys themselves. But that's very complicated, and we can't rule out the possibility of spillover. Um, when you look at probably the most famous example of spillover from a prion disease in an animal to people was uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, the so-called mad cow disease. Um, huge numbers of people were exposed, and just over 200 actually got sick and were affected. Now, for those 200, it was catastrophic because it is still 100% fatal and there are no treatments in any species. So what made those 200 get sick and everyone else, as far as we know, was okay after that? Although it has very long incubation periods, so there are new cases still. Um, and when you go to the Red Cross to donate blood, do you, know, do you remember them asking you about whether you've um, lived in Great Britain during this time period? It's because of mad cow disease. They don't want you donating blood if you were exposed. That's how pervasive it was. So um, what it probably came down to was the genetics of those individuals. So just like some animals are more predisposed to having the disease or less predisposed, there are probably people in our population that are more susceptible to prion disease spillover. So, but we don't know who they are. So that's one problem. The other problem is that whether a spillover event occurs is gonna come down to three factors. The route and dose by which a person's exposed, that person's genetics, and the strain of the prion that they're exposed to. And we don't know very much about CWD strains. Uh, we act like CWD is CWD is CWD. It isn't. We, we know that much. Um, so the problem is, is that the more people that are exposed and the more we allow new strains to emerge, the more likely it is that we're going to come across a really poor combination that's going to have a bad outcome for the individual. But if you have a bad outcome for the individual, the social response to that would be much broader. And so it is, I think, in everyone's best interest to prevent human exposure um, because basically, the more human exposure we have, the more opportunities we're creating. So the risk is low, but the more times that we in, uh, expose people, we're making it less low. We're basically driving it up ourselves. So when I refer to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they have recommendations specifically for CWD and hunters. They, uh, when hunting in uh, CWD-affected areas, they do not recommend shooting or handling obviously sick animals. They recommend wearing gloves when cleaning the animals. Uh, they recommend minimizing contact with organs that would have a higher concentration. The concentration in the muscle would be pretty low, but tissues like the brain, the spinal cord, the spleen, they're gonna have much higher concentrations of prion. Uh, they do recommend using separate utensils for cleaning, uh, particularly field dressing. And then, it's very interesting, I have this highlighted not because it's the most important part, but because it's the most applicable to you. They say, if you want to get your deer tested, go talk to your state wildlife agency. Didn't ask me if I wanted them to say that. I don't think they asked you. But they did the only practical thing because we're the ones testing. We're the only ones testing. 
So they send people to us, and now even though we're not public health agencies, they've placed the purview on us to provide testing for uh, the general public. They uh, recommend strongly considering having your deer tested if you're hunting in an affected area, and then they do not recommend consuming positive animals. They also recommend if you're having your harvested game commercially processed, talk to your processor and request that it be uh, uh, processed separately. Some processors will do that, some won't. Um, but again, this recommendation that if it tests positive, they do not recommend eating the meat. I will tell you this also aligns with uh, recommendations from the World Health Organization and others around the world that generally animals with any form of prion disease are not considered fit for human consumption. So I'll s wrap this up. My professional recommendations after uh, leading our program for the last six years you know, CWD is a serious issue. And I know you have a plan, but if that's important, have a plan, have it written down, have something you can share. I think the trend now, lots of states have revised their CWD management plans, and most of them are aligning those plans with the AFWA BMPs. That's the most useful aspect of this. If you can align them with the BMPs, you're basically meeting industry standards. If you're not gonna align with the BMPs, you're probably going to need a very good explanation for your public because, and, and there are places that we don't align, and we have to explain that. Um, but those are going to be the industry standards at this point. Uh, build partnerships. Oh, trust is transparent. Uh, comes from transparency. We tell our public everything, absolutely everything. We do our due diligence, make sure we have all the information we need to give good information, but we don't hide anything. This is hard. It's going to be hard, and and trying to not make it look uh, as difficult as it is only makes it worse. Tell them everything. Build partnerships. I can tell you the most effective thing that we have done is working with taxidermists to get samples. That has been a tremendous partnership for us. And, uh, but we also partner with our Department of Agriculture, our Department of Health. Our Department of Health, we wanted a public health section in our management plan, but we didn't feel like we were qualified to write it. They wrote that section of our management plan for us because they're the experts. So partnerships are incredibly important. Follow the science. If you're following the BMPs, you'll be following the science, but also be adaptive because new science comes out constantly. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, I wouldn't make any rapid changes unless you have a very, very good reason. Um, don't consider year-to-year -year prevalence. You know, use either three or five-year increments to evaluate because things are going to bounce around a lot. Um, if you are at a low prevalence, it might be several years. We've had some big gaps between our detections in counties at times. Um, Independence County is a great example. We had one detection. And we were several years down the road, and, and we thought we were in the clear. And then this year, we had two new detections in that county. So um, be very measured in your approach. Remember, it is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's incredibly important to participate in research if we're going to continue to develop new tools as a nation to deal with this important issue. I was once told you never leave an audience without giving them resources, and yourself doesn't count. So these are the resources that I will leave you with. Uh, your own Mississippi State University has uh, put out a new series of videos that are really fantastic. I was pleased to be able to participate in this. It was funded by a multi-state grant. Those are now available on the MSU Deer Lab TV YouTube channel. There's an entire playlist of these uh, animated sort of um, videos. They're very short. They take important issues about CWD and break them down into really palatable little pieces. So they're a great resource to share with your public. And uh, that QR code takes you to the Chronic Wasting Disease Alliance. That is an independent group that evaluates science, keeps up with the news, and keeps a, um, a reference of all of the uh, rules and regs in different states so that you can make comparisons. So they're a great independent resource for CWD information. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. And is the movement of live deer also prohibited? 
Um, from outside, from inside the zone outward, yes. Well, Illinois, Wisconsin, just in case I, I spoke to the director of Illinois years ago, they were able to go in and concentrate, basically harvest a bunch of deer in a concentrated area because their, their habitat's so different near Arkansas. Mm -hmm. so have you, Arkansas looked at that in more of a concentrated harvest? Like um, we have. Um, for resource reasons, we are only able to apply that on our outliers. So we go to the points that are furthest out and kind of the leading edge where we believe our prevalence is still low, and we put all, kind of all of our marbles into that area. So we draw a two-mile circle around those outlying points, and we, well, we'll give private lands tags. We'll give extra tags to hunters within 10 miles. Within two miles, we um, actually go in post-season and remove additional deer from within those two miles. Um, one of our areas, we actually use um, USDA Wildlife Services to do that. In other areas, we do it ourselves. I'll tell you, uh, Missouri also does that, and Tennessee does that and uses Wildlife Services. So it, there's several states implementing that. Illinois is the one that's um, published on their results. Um, but you can contract it or you can do it yourselves, but that's how we, we typically apply that. No, um, they, I believe, sh they shot from the ground and I believe used, just used trucks at night and, and removed them that way. Um, we've only done that the last three years, so we really can't measure those results quite yet, but, um, you know, we, we feel optimistic that it, it's got to be helping. And we thank you. Great presentation. Okay. We've got to kind of getting ready for the next meeting, so okay. we appreciate it. Thank you for coming.
thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here safely, giving us traveling space. And we pray, Father God, right now for our petitioners. We will give them wisdom uh, to make decisions that will impact this agency. Continue to bless our executive staff and men and women in this agency. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Before we get started, we have a honor today to have the Honorable Mayor of the great of, of Cleveland, Mississippi. He wants to say a few words. He's a longtime friend of mine, and Billy Nile. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Move adoption. Motion been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion been made. And second. Any further comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Okay. On today's agenda, before we get to the day's approval uh, day's agenda, I think uh, Commissioner Cooperwood has a presentation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, as y'all may know that. Maybe I want to say a few words, but I have one question for you. Would you like to see my little ducky? 
Did you bring your little girl? Little son, you not. You tell that story. <laughs> That's you. That's, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's quite an honor for y'all to bestow this upon me. Uh, one thing I can say is I was doing and a story out on Mississippi Road with uh, Andrew Number with our food network. And we were out there staging a couple of months, of course, you know, we, with all that TV crew and everything. Uh, he asked me one time, he said, you know, he said, I got on, you've been hunting three or four years. Well, this was five years ago. I said, no, I've been hunting 50 years, but that was five years ago. So, yes, I've been a part of this for a long, long time, choking up thinking about this. And I think that truly the best conservationists that we have are the hunters, and especially those hunters that have access to land or have land to be able to continue the tradition of what we have here, especially in this Mississippi Delta, all over Mississippi, but especially in the Delta, to create habitat, to plant trees, to do what we can for the wildlife so they can continue to come back down. And as another note, when I was getting out of my car, I took my hat off to see if my hair was where it's supposed to be, and I saw a flock of ducks fly over my head. <laughs> in the reflection of the windshield. And sure enough, looked up, and there was six or seven, I think they were dead all the way around here somewhere. So thank you for this. Uh, keep up the great work y'all are doing, and we do our best to keep this habitat going and the conservation for the following folks, our children, our grandchildren, and those yet to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What about the pumps, Hank? Good job, Cupwood. Uh, today's agenda, Mr. Posey. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we can pretty much stand the way it is, except that we have under other business uh, have a presentation on the Prentice County Court case, and we need to discuss a resolution under other business. Other than that, uh, I think we can. I think we've got to change our next. Uh, Today, yeah, too. we do. You go ahead and do that now. Uh, the next commission dating date, if everybody's good with that, we would like to look at Tuesday, the 15th of February, Jackson office, 9 o'clock. The education session begin at 9 o'clock. Adam Butler, our turkey biologist, will be presenting some findings that he has and recommendations he has for the 2024 turkey season at that time. And uh, if that's good with everybody, that we'll. We'll, stop. we'll put that on tentatively and, uh, and hopefully it'll work out for everybody to be there. I've got on my calendar February the 15th on Wednesday. It's on a Wednesday. Maybe a Wednesday. Let me double check. I think that's on Wednesday. It is. Okay. Wednesday then. Wednesday, February the 15th. So if we're not going to Lewis. All right. Wednesday, February the 15th. I have a motion to accept the I'll make a motion. Motion been made. Mayor, second. Second. Motion been made. Second. We accept today's agenda. Mr. Chairman, I might want to go on and note that Commissioner Benson's with us by phone. Yeah, he's on the phone. Uh -huh. Commissioner Benson's got the coach, so we told him to stay away from him. So he's, he's listening. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Okay, the only thing I got public comment is uh, Ed Pitty.
prohibit movement of pin rays and live deer, as well as carcasses. And I'm asking you today, what will you do? What will you do to stop the spread of CWD in our state, in our deer? You know how important it is to our state, to our economy. What's your legacy? Ed, let me ask you a question. Ed, are you are you here speaking on behalf of Ducks Unlimited, or are you speaking personally? I'm speaking at the Cleveland County land. Okay. okay. How much land? How much land you have down in Cleveland County? We have about 300 acres. Yeah. Okay. I used to live in Cleveland County. Our family owns quite a bit more, but okay. that's where we uh, that's where we live. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ed, question is Tim and Claiborne. Kind of encouraged by the committee to testing. Is there any kind of movement for landowners to test more? Maybe? Yeah, I've encouraged all the landowners and owners and to test. Some of the deer that we've been able to kill with my kids, we can sample those. So, uh, you know, all we can do is test, but there are certain things that we can be yeah. proactive, not reactive about. And unfortunately, there have been reactions. Thank you. Strikes and sales, Jason. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, yeah. our report for the month of December shows an upgrade of 5%. Hello? That was not real. I think people streaming can't hear it very well either. Oh. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Mr. Posey. Uh, you have before you uh, the 2002 alligator season report, uh, hot off the press, and wish to go over just a few things briefly about the 2022 alligator season. Uh, for 2022, we had a total number of applications of 7,050 applicants this year. That's up uh, 947 uh, from what we had in 2021. 
the total alligator harvest on public waters was 830. That's up 54 from 2021. The average length of all alligators harvested was seven feet point seven point five eight feet, uh, just barely down from seven point seven eight uh, in 2021. The number of participants during the alligator season was 871 permit holders, up 20 from what we had in 2021. The average hunting party uh, encompasses 4.4 persons. Uh, the total number of hunters who actually harvest an alligator, we issued 980 permits and 728 of those harvested alligators this past season. That's up 59 from what we had in 2021. Uh, another interesting statistic that I like to give out is the number of alligators that are actually captured and released in addition to those that are caught and harvested. Uh, in 2022, there were 1,669 alligators caught and released. That's up 88 from those that were caught in 2021. Well, yeah, since the limit allows them to take two alligators and only one of them can exceed seven feet in length, oftentimes they uh, hook into an alligator and get it on up alongside the boat and it either is below the criteria, above the criteria, and they'll release it. This year we did have a new uh, record. Uh, we have a new record length for female alligators and consequently, uh, it is an alligator that my program captured and released, tag, captured, tagged, and released back in June 11th of 2009, uh, commonly known as Yellow 410. And she was 10 foot 2 inches long on July 11th, 2009. And when she was caught this alligator hunting season, she was still 10 feet 2 inches. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about that is we know that uh, from the biological work that's been done uh, for decades that the female alligators can experience exponential growth or, or, and to a point where they get to a point where they simply do not grow anymore. And we don't know exactly what point that occurs and it, it apparently can occur at different lengths with females, but we have no idea how old uh, yellow 410 was. Uh, there is a aging technique uh, where you can take uh, microscopic cross sections of the femur and send them off to a lab for microscopic observation to try and determine how many annular rings are in the bone. Just like a tree, uh, every year uh, they produce these annular rings of growth in those bones. Uh, we sent uh, her bones as well as five other uh, examples of uh, alligators that were taken this year to a lab in Montana and had them uh, analyzed. Unfortunately, the results were not what I hoped. We also have learned that uh, those growth rings can be absorbed over time and so you can only get a minimum age. My estimate was based on my experience that yellow 410 was probably in the vicinity of 75 years old, could be a little less, could be more, really don't know. Unfortunately, the results from the lab was that she was no older, or her minimum age was 18. There were only 18 annular rings left in her bone. So obviously she's been absorbing those rings over time, but um, you know that's something left for, uh, for science to keep working on. And I find it very interesting. Obviously, this is a, a matriarch among the alligator population. Um, just considering that she'd been tagged for 13 years and she didn't grow in length at all. Uh, so very old alligator out there. Uh, just fortunate that uh, one of our hunters was able to capture it again and uh, get it back to us because I've known she's been out there since 2009. At the time when she was caught in 2009, when we tagged her, she tied the world record for the length of uh, female alligator, a live rank, live uh, free ranging alligator. Uh, the only other record of a 10 foot two female in uh, the world was in Florida in 1989, uh, some on a similar pro uh, research project. So to be able to get that information back was very interesting. And we have 
uh, over 800 alligators that we've caught and tagged uh, since 2007 in the program. And we continue to get uh, tag returns every year. This year we had 11 alligators captured by hunters that were previously tagged by MDWFP. And we provide a certificate to them, much like when you uh, harvest a duck with a duck band on it. And we get all the historical information back to those hunters. And uh, also, uh, if you hadn't heard yet, um, I'm departing the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and Parks after 29 and a half years of service. I will be uh, departing the Department of Wildlife Fisheries to take a position with the Mississippi Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund uh, as their project manager supervisor. And I'll be starting that position February 1. And before I go, I just want to uh, thank the agency uh, for a, uh, a career that I could have never imagined uh, that I would have the opportunity to do what I've done uh, as an adult. When I was a young kid, uh, I grew up watching the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom and was envious of what I saw on TV and hoped that maybe one day I'd get to do that, and, but never thought that those kinds of dreams would come true. And, uh, I've been afforded those opportunities by working with the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and greatly appreciate it. And uh, I just wanted to depart with a, a few notes um, that uh, whoever my successor is and, and you as a commission are going to continue to deal with requests and, and comments about alligator hunting in the state of Mississippi. And I just want to say a few things, and that is that there's always going to be a request from the public to increase the number of tags each year. We deal with that constantly. And uh, what is in place is working perfectly. Uh, and this is not a, a hunting season to try and provide you know, population reduction. Uh, it's about an opportunity where we have an alligator population that is, is sustained, that can withstand some minimal uh, hunting harvest by recreational hunters, and it's working very well. And the process we have in place is something that's taken a long time to develop. We've been working on this for 19 years now. And we've had this electronic process uh, with the help of our license department and NIC, our third party entity that handles our application drawing process. It's working great. Our customers are very familiar with this process uh, on both public waters and private lands. And uh, it's a very complex machine and my recommendations would be to always maintain the status quo uh, that we have in place to ensure a smooth transition uh, in the years to come. The harvest data that we uh, obtain, the biological information that I provide, I, I assure you that all the recommendations I've ever provided came to you as a biologist as on this technical staff. And it's always the resource first and the hunting public second. And I think, uh, what's in place. The harvest data is showing that what we're doing is working perfectly. The average alligator taken every year only fluctuates about two inches, and that's going back to all the way to 2014. Uh, other biological data is showing that what's, what's going on is working just right. We're not providing a detrimental uh, impact on the alligator population. Uh, also, the current parameters that are in place are ensuring a reasonable, amount, a reasonable amount of opportunity without overcrowding our hunting parties on the public waterways. And I think that is the next most important thing is that for what we do provide, we want to make sure that our hunting public has a, a very positive uh, recreational experience out there. And with that, I appreciate it. If you have any questions about the 2002 alligator season report, I'd be glad to entertain well, We thank you, Ricky. We will certainly miss you. You, you've taken a program from scratch. Why did you, no, nobody else had it. You brought it up to the yeah. 900 people played. How much did it cost per license? Uh, it cost them $225. Okay. Yeah. That's not to pay you. Well, and I couldn't have done it without, uh, couldn't have done it without other state agencies. And uh, you know, I've, I've always recognized the state of Georgia as uh, I took their from for Mississippi and uh, you know, in all of our programs, no matter what species we're dealing with, uh, we glean from each other in other states and other state agencies, and uh, I, can't, I couldn't have done it without them.
and wish you well in your new endeavor. And you've been a, you've been a great employee here. I'm sure we'll employees. continue to meet and cooperate together in my future position. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Rick is someone who Gator hunts, as you know, served here a lot of Gator hunters. That, uh, I think you've done a fantastic job of managing it, and people, people even the law enforcement part, respect you a lot. But my main question, who's going who's gonna to provide goobers for people after you're gone? Well, I've considered uh, setting up like a booth at some of the most popular uh, boat ramps during the alligator season, and I'll disperse them out that way. Just, just everybody knows, Ricky would go on, as he was checking people, he'd have a bag of gold peanuts and share them with the folks. Man, they, they, they've become quite popular. That's right. Ricky, I just uh, best of luck in your new endeavor. Thank you. I just want to also thank you for your service, and you spent a lot of time here in Cleveland, Bolivar County, and I appreciate that as well. So Thanks. good luck to you in everything you're doing. We really appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Do they have an alligator season in Arkansas? They do. I got to go on my first alligator hunt this year. It was really fun. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, Brian, first, I think we've got a couple of things to do. Pass out some information first, just for your uh, uh, situation where. So I just uh, wanted to pass out this information. It's just the uh, Mississippi State Park Capital Improvement Plan. Just to uh, take with you, uh, if you got any questions about it later or any time before the next commission meeting, just uh, give me a call and we can go through it. Uh, today, the only thing that we have on the agenda is to uh, accept the uh, to adopt the rule to adopt Rule 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, we didn't have any public comments on either. Um, so I just ask that we adopt those rules today. I make a motion, Mr. Chairman, that we adopt uh, the state part. Why don't we do them one at a time? Do do one rule yeah. 1.1. 1. 1. Rule 1.1. 1. 1. Motion been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Go ahead, Brian. All right. Second one is uh, Rule 1.2, General Rules and Regulations for State Parks. I uh, ask that this time we have uh, to adopt those. We also had no public comment on that one as well. Okay. A second. Aye. Motion made. Second. Any more? Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. That's all I have for you, gentlemen, you got any, unless you got any questions. Understand they're making some good improvements around the state of the yes, state sir. parks. Yes, sir. We got uh, the our two model cabins at Roosevelt taken care of. They've been finalized. They'll go. Oh, they'll open on March uh, first. Uh, they're looking really good. Love to uh, have you out there. Take a look at Roosevelt. We got uh, Tishomingo who's finalized their campground. Uh, Buccaneers finalized theirs as well. We have a lot of different, if you look at that capital improvement plan, there is a five-year plan there. A lot of improvements uh, on the horizon. I think we have a really good team and staff, and it's just, it's, it's working out really well for, uh, for everybody. Did you, did you have a legislative group come to Roosevelt? How many of them We had, so we've had, We've had three stakeholder meetings, one in Hattiesburg, we had one in Clark County, and we've had one in, in uh, at Roosevelt uh, last week. So we had a, a lot of participation in all of those. So had a, a really good group, about 20 people in Hattiesburg, uh, probably nearly 30 in Clark County, and at Roosevelt, probably another 20 legislators and uh, business owners and uh, other citizens, mayors and uh, landowners, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right. Thank you. Gary Carter, law enforcement. Gary, you've got a presentation to make. You want to do it before or after you do your I'll do it after. It's okay. After you do it. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Commissioners, good morning. Mr. Posey. Law 
enforcement makes this report for the month of December. This is our citation report. For the month of December, there were a total of 1,296 citations issued. Our top five being no license at 203. Hunting from a public road was 95. No hunter orange, 65. Supplemental feeding is 55 and trespassing is 50. On our next page is a photo here of uh, results of an officer doing some enforcement that came across this uh, uh, violation here in Jefferson County on the supplemental feeding. That's me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It ain't in the speed test or something. Graham. That's me. Yes, sir. Uh, on our next pictures here shows uh, our officers working in George County, uh, checking a group of uh, dog hunters. And on our next page, I, I kind of like to entitle this one, the David, the David's meeting the Goliath. Uh, this is Officer Howell. He's uh, his opportunity to speak with two of our future hunters uh, on a morning uh, deer hunt there. They look like they paid attention. <laughs> yes, sir. I wonder if they were successful. <laughs> so hats off to my guys uh, for a fine job they did in the month of December uh, on enforcement. Our shooting ranges report uh, for customers from the De December the 4th, 22, to January 17th of 2023. As uh, MacIver has uh, reported with a total of 590 customers. Turcott, 1,136 customers, and McHenry report with 849 customers. And at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, call uh, these gentlemen forward as they are here for a, a license reinstatement. Uh, the first individual I have is Mr. Dalton Sibley. Uh, the, uh, this happened date of the uh, county of the violation happened in Newton County. The arresting officer was captain, was, uh, was officer uh, Colton Fulton. Uh, this individual was, uh, date of the violation was January the 26th, 2021. And the date of the conviction was December 14th of 2021. And Mr. Sibley is here now to tell his side of the story. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, I was out riding around one night and there was a deer that ran out in front of me and I swerved and hit him and I had taken a video of it on my phone and I stupidly posted it on social media, stupidly hit the deer, swerved to hit him and uh, I can assure you if you read the statement it, you won't ever hear my name again in this type of situation. You hit the deer with big on the video. What you yeah, it, I took a video and I the deer run out in the road and I swerved and hit him purposely, of course. And then I got out and showed that the video was dead. I loaded him up, took him home. What did it do to your vehicle when you hit it? No, it was an older truck, had a steel bumper on it. Social media got you. Yeah. But I cruel to do that to an animal like that. It's yeah, absolutely yes, sir, it cruel was. to get my book. It was. What about you going through this uh, hunter's education? Yes, sir. I did it online. How much was your fine? Uh, it ended up being $2,200 after everything's said and done. You take your, uh, well, what about <laughs> your, uh, your uh, weapon? What, what they, did you get it confiscated? No, sir. No, sir. It had to be your truck, I reckon. Yeah. Anything else, uh, Colonel? Uh, Mr. Sibley has been all the requirements set forth for the reason, <clears throat> so we, we recommend that you all reinstate the matter. Uh, does anybody have a motion? Uh, one more question. Was it a doe or a buck? It was a doe. No. A motion. Reinstate. Motion been made to reinstate the second. I'll second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor? Uh, aye. Motion carried.
Mr. Stevens, you've been reinstated. <coughs> we don't want to see you again. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. We have Mr. Tyson Champagne. This uh, county violation happened in Kemper County. The arresting officer was Officer Hall. The date of the violation was uh, January 17th, 2021. The date of his conviction was December 15th, 2021. And Ms. Champagne is here to tell his uh, story. Okay, Mr. Champagne. How many people from Louisiana buy uh, Mississippi out of state license? About 70,000 people from Louisiana. So we thank you for it. Oh, no problem. Uh, right. Just wish I wasn't here for this situation. Tell what stupid thing you did. Well, the stupid thing I did was uh, we were on the way back from the store to get some ice. Uh, one of my friend's girlfriend shot a deer. And on the way back, I had a passenger. We saw a deer on the side of the road. Um, uh, the passenger wanted to turn around. And then we turned around and we looked at it. Kind of was, thought it was fake, looked fake. It was basically laying on all fours. He said it was real. So we turned around two or three times. Um, and you know, we did have a gun in the back seat. Uh, not loaded, but the shells were within the vicinity. We ended up turning around for the third time. When we turned around, we decided, you know, we're going back to the camp. And the whole time, I think uh, law enforcement was behind us with no lights on and stopped us. Um, got us out of the car, you know, um, arrested me, and uh, basically that's what happened. Um, but I, let me back up a little bit. I did put some spotlights on the, on the highway. I did put, have a, um, a big, I had a big grill with a big spotlight area, and I put that on flash that a few times. So I did do that. That's the harassment of the game I got. Um, and we just got stopped, and it was a stupid mistake. Uh, won't happen again. The only person I heard in the situation is my boys, you know. Yeah. Not good at hunting this area. So um, I'm just asking for reinstatement. That way uh, we can continue to hunt and add to the revenue to this was it deer? I, I th you know, no word if it was, but it, if a deer's laying down on all fours in the edge of the grass, I'm, I'm assuming that they're not watching traffic. It, it was it was definitely mechanical. They were having a sting operation that night, um, Colton. Uh, and yeah, they will. I just happened to pass at the wrong time, but honestly, I'm glad it happened. Learned my lesson. Uh, and I'm ready to get this over with and move on. How much money did it cost you? Um, I got a lawyer involved. That didn't help. I probably should have. Uh, um, that was 2000. I think the fine was around 2000 and 500 I'm going to pay today. So probably it was a $5,000 $5, mistake. All, you know, all said and done. You know. I think that's a record that I've heard. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, the guy in the Patrick side, he was, he just pled guilty and, and did all that. But it's just, he was a shyster anyway. No more of a friend of mine. And I wouldn't have probably turned around if it wouldn't have been him. But I, I'll take ownership of it and you know, move on. It sounds like to me you've got remorse, and that's... Yeah, I'm just hurting my kids. you won't do it again. Oh, no, no. I got a Ford F-150 now, no spotlights. And the only light, lights I have on there is bright lights. I ain't for, I ain't for doing that. <laughs> I'm glad you brought but that part in. Well, no, I'll, that's because the part I, I was wondering that's why what? the officer stopped you until you told us to turn the Yeah, the lights, and I didn't go off the highway. I was on the main highway, but still, <laughs> yeah. the lights were so bright. Um, to be honest with you, they were the aftermarket lights. That you could light up the world, would it? Um, and that's, you know, the harassing game part. Right. <clears throat> Tyson, did you drive up here from Alma today? Or? I did. I left at 4 o'clock this morning. Wanted to get this over with and uh, go back to my work. You know? Yes, sir. Currently, more to the store? How, how far was it there off the road that you saw? Um, you know, you know, there's no shoulder right there, so I'm looking at probably 20 yards off the road. Um, uh, he saw two of them and he turned around to get out. We got a mechanical deer on the scene. Uh, yeah, he was, he was, you know, I didn't go direct. There was nowhere to turn to look at the deer, but it was basically my lights were so bright that yeah. you can see like daylight. Yeah. Well, at least he didn't shoot. Okay. No, he didn't shoot. Uh, we wasn't, we wasn't going to shoot. We talked about it in the car. You know, he, he mentioned it, to be honest. And, and uh, 
I'm glad we didn't, you know, we didn't even do it too like that. So I'm glad it's the way it is, you know. Still bought me five houses, but I learned my lesson. I turn them around ever again. <laughs> no matter what. Well, okay. What's the, what's, what's the feeling of the commission? Second. Yes, sir. All right, motion's been made to reinstate Mr. Champagne. And motion been made and second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. We appreciate you hunting Mississippi and we, we go to Louisiana fishing a lot, so we appreciate that. Sure. All the way down there, on the Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have Mr. Michael Hill. Mr. Michael Hill. Uh, Michael Hill, this happened in Panola County, the resident officer was Pape Mayor Costco. Uh, date of violation was January 26, 2020. Date of conviction was November the 10th, 2020. And Mr. Hill is here to uh, tell his story. All right, Mr. Hill. Yes, sir. I was on the way to the house, and it was me, my wife, and my cousin in the truck. And I pulled into the driveway, and we seen a couple deer, and my cousin wanted to shoot them. Well, I tried to talk him out of it, tried to talk him out of it. Well, I stopped. I did, out of stupidity. And he shot at the deer and missed it. And well, we went to bed, and about 3 o'clock that morning, Mr. Payton knocked on my door, and uh, Asked me what happened. We told him what happened, whatever. It's been a pretty big mistake. It cost me a lot of money, a lot of money, and I won't ever do it again. You live in, you live in court? I do. I live in court. Okay. I do. Sorry. It actually took place in, uh, you know where Macedonia Road is? Yeah. That's where, that's where I was living at the time. Yeah, I think we live close to where I live. In Panola County, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, y'all won't ever have to see me in here. You've gone like two years now without hunting? Yeah. How about, did you say you had a nephew or a kid with you or somebody? Where, it was yeah. my wife. It was my wife and my cousin. So they weren't able to go hunt either? You nope, know? they, ain't, they ain't been able to hunt either. <laughs> so how much money did it cost you? In between me and my wife, be five grand. It's twenty five hundred. Yeah. Well, has she been down here to get real estate? She went to Jackson. I was supposed to go, but I was at work. Oh, that was last year. Yeah, she's already. Yeah, yeah, last year. Yeah, I know. They said you couldn't get off of work. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What about your gun? Confiscated. It wasn't mine. It was his, but it is confiscated. We've had two in here in the last month. Granddaddy's gun got confiscated. I mean, I don't think that. No. It's bad. And, the table tonight. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't take all the dang guns in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am, really am. You, through the process that you you learn why, why I shoot it at night, why it's such a class one violation, why it's, just, I mean, why it's, it's a more serious violation. Did you, did you, did it's you dangerous. You, you can't see what's behind them, you can't see what's. Around. I mean, as long as you, you can't see, unknown. yeah, you can't see nothing but yeah. what's on the lights. You know? I mean, it's just, I mean, people just, everybody makes mistakes, but it's shooting well, the bullet at night, the bullet doesn't know where it's going. That's right. You shoot it, you think a deer, somebody's prized bull is out there, or something. Well, you don't ever know what's right behind it. Or a person. I mean, yeah. could Some, somebody could be tracking a deer at night, bow hunting or something, I mean, who knows what. You know? That's right. Yes, sir. He has met all the requirements of the C4 for the state service. I agree with the report. Everything that he's done is the recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved again. Second. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. I think you maybe have to stop by the yeah. see somebody with some money. Y'all won't see me again. Well, don't want to see you again, buddy. <laughs> Carl, Carl, before you step down, uh, just, I don't know if you prepared to talk about this, but I know 
they've had some details on waterfowl up here in the Delta. It sounded like it was fairly successful at doing some things, but. Yes, sir. And then maybe off of the, um, the scatters and just any kind of update on general waterfowl enforcement, things going on? Well, enforcement efforts, uh, as, as usual, every year, it, it was good. Where our officers, they did a great job. Uh, we pulled other officers from other parts of the state. They, uh, this probably never got a chance to work duck hunting in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, it was a it was a good effort uh, enforcement wise from our, our officers. So it, was a, it was a it was a good enforcement effort that we did. Yes, what about the scatters? Did we? Uh, we had officers at the scatters, but basically we we kind of uh, really made did our details more out of other parts of the of the Delta area counties. But officers did enforce the, the scatters as well. So we did make some cases as well. They were in Tallahassee County looking for you. Not good. They looked at me up a tree, I could find it. <laughs> do you have a presentation to make? I do, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to save the best for last, and I would like to recognize an officer. Uh, he just stated that this is his last commission meeting, and so we'd like to call him to come up front, Mr. Ricky Flint. Ricky has served very well with us in the enforcement, and uh, we'd like to Show us, show you our appreciation. Present you with a certificate, sir. And it reads, Certificate of Appreciation to Ricky Flint, the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Law Enforcement Bureau, shows its appreciation for your dedicated and committed services of 29 years and seven months in the protection of wildlife enforcement to the state of Mississippi. We truly appreciate, we are truly appreciative of your service and wish you the best in your future endeavors, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know if I gave you one, but you got it now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Colonel. That's it, sir. Thank you very much, unless you all have a question. If not, that's my report. Mr. Pose. Yes, sir. Now I'd like to recognize Mr. Drew Malone uh, to discuss a court case that we recently uh, handed down, and I think it'd be of interest to you, everyone in the audience. <laughs> yeah. This is a. Uh, Drew, would you mind to give the microphone? So, strange night. Present here in court. Sure. No, then I'll start yelling. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get Doug to jump in here, too. This is really a, a, an interesting matter. This is from the Chance Report of Prentice County. And in this case, uh, basically the plaintiffs were landowners and they were having issues with dog hunters uh, putting their dogs out on their property and then also parking on the right of way right outside uh, the plaintiff's home. And so, uh, and these dog hunters had been checked multiple times by the conservation officers and they always said, well, we're not hunting, we're just merely retrieving our dogs. So the, um, there were conflicts between the plaintiffs and the dog hunters through several years and there was uh, physical altercations, there were allegations that they were putting tacks in the, the uh, driveway of the plaintiffs and so finally, the plaintiffs just had enough, and they filed suit in the Chancery Court of Prentice County. Uh, a hearing was had, and the judge in this matter issued a 46-page opinion. And it is one of the most well-written opinions I've seen on this matter dealing with this subject. Bottom line is, is that the court held that despite the fact that the, the defendants were arguing that they were merely retrieving their dogs, that they still have liability in letting their dogs out on private property and running across private property. That there are elements of the law as far as nuisance and, and, and other legal issues that come into play and you can't merely state that I'm releasing my dogs and I'm not hunting. In fact, and there is one of the things that uh, in one of the paragraphs it said, much like headlighting deer, road hunting for deer has also been described as a sorry form of human behavior, 
made unlawful by the wild, wildlife conservation laws of this state. And that is stating the FAR case, uh, which is a case that, that we deal with frequently. Um, the court also noted that the legislative efforts to protect private landowners in Mississippi from deer dogs coming under their property has failed. However, the common law tort of nuisance remains available to private landowners along with the broad powers of this court. Through the years, uh, I know that Mr. Mann has stated that if you're having these issues with dog hunters on private property, then it is incumbent upon the landowner themselves to take action. A lot of times, uh, the private landowners will look toward this commission or to the department to take some sort of action. However, as pointed out, um, if a, a hunter is in the right of way legally, and you know they they have you know they don't have a loaded gun, they're doing everything they're supposed to do, then that's not a violation, and there's no restrictions that this commission can place upon them. However, and it's interesting that if you'll notice uh, in the uh, the colonel's report, hunting from the public road was I think number three on the number of citations that were issued. So that's a prevalent issue. Um, in this particular case, the court held that um, and actually granted an injunction against the dog hunters that they could not park in the right of way outside the landowners. In fact, and I, and I, love, um, I love this quote from the court, um, because at one point what the dog hunters were saying is you can't restrict our activities because we have a constitutional right to hunt. And the court uh, very wisely noted, well, you can't have it both ways. You're saying that you have a constitutional right to hunt, but every time that conservation officer comes to you, you say that you're not hunting, that you're merely trying to pick up your dogs. And he said, so you, you can't have it both ways. I mean, you're either hunting, and if you're hunting, then you need to be issued a citation, or you're not hunting, and if you're not hunting, I'm going to enter an injunction against you that says you can't park in front of these people's uh, property and you can't put your dogs out on these people's property. Uh, as the court said, the, the defendant's argument is that, in, that their capacity of running dogs across plaintiff's property, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and parking on the public right of way to catch their dogs is a protected hunting activity under the Mississippi Code. However, as detailed below, defendants always deny that they are hunting when confronted by the conservation officers, and the defendants deny that they are hunting on or near the public roadway along the plaintiff's property was also made multiple times under oath during these proceedings. So the defendants in that matter continue to say, uh, on the one hand, we're not hunting, we're merely uh, retrieving our dogs, then on the other hand saying, but you can't prevent us from doing that because we're hunting. Uh, the court didn't buy that. Uh, the court has, uh, entered a uh, injunction that says that you are, that they are hereby stopped to deny that they were hunting when it's better suited to them to claim that they're hunting and you can't come and change your, uh, you know, your activity, your description of your activity at this time. In the end, like I said, the court entered an injunction that stated that they will not be allowed to, uh, to park on the right of way next to plaintiff's property. Uh, the important thing from this department standpoint is the court also noted that violation of this court order is uh, actually going to be uh, a violation of a court order and not a crime in and of itself in that it's not going to be the conservation officers that will be the ones to enforce this court order that would fall upon either the sheriff's department or, you know, the local PD. Um, it's, a, um, it's a wonderful case. Uh, it's an interesting case. It's one that we have heard, uh, we've had landowners come before this commission for years now complaining about the issues that they're having with dog hunting. Through the years, we've always said that that is a civil matter, that there's very little, if anything, that the department can do. And these uh, plaintiffs just got fed up with it and they took it to court and they prevailed. So that's, uh, like I said, it's in the Chancery Court of Prentice County, Mississippi. 
It's the uh, Featherstone uh, Dickerson case versus Steve Allen et al. So, like I said, it's a it's a good case, um, and it's it's a 46 page opinion that's very well reasoned. Do y'all have any questions on that? Is that, is that just for Freddie's to make the case being go? No, it that? actually is just going to be specific to right in front of the plaintiff's property and on the plaintiff's property. Uh, this is uh, a case that it really just affects the parties involved. The plaintiff is it. Yes, sir. Cool. Yes. And so uh, it, the, uh, the only argument you can make is that if, uh, if somebody else wanted to bring such a case, then they would look to this case and say, well, there is precedent in Prentice County of, of taking this action. But it is only good for these specific facts. Each case falls on its own facts. And uh, the court listening to the facts and listening to had eight witnesses in this matter. The court ruled that no, we think that what you're doing is, is creating a nuisance, and I'm not going to allow it in. Question Is there an appellate process? They... I don't know. I called the clerk to find out what the status of it was. She wasn't sure if they were going to appeal it or not. Maybe um, <laughs> this they will. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if the time has lapsed yet. So if, if it's appealed and it moves up, it is up, and then the, the court then and it will cover it. more than just British County, right? No. So it well, no, no, it, 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 no. It would just be once again just the four yeah, corners of this case, right. and then the court, I'm, either I'm, the court I'm, of appeals. I'm trying to get it statewide. Well, this would at least open the door, but this would not uh, apply statewide. The courts, the appeal courts, would look at the facts of this case and decide if the actions taken was within the purview of the Chancery Court or not. Uh, but it would not be statewide, it's just limited to Prentice County. Uh, we merely wanted to bring this court, this case to y'all's attention because it's really the first one that we've heard of um, that, that, that's been successful and it is such a well-written opinion that we thought it would, um, it would be of value for the commission to at least be made aware of it and then also you know, be able to look at it with a rush so the message for dog hunters that want to do the right thing and do it the right way is not to park by a private property, maybe, and have well, a, I mean, or have a place where you do it where your dogs stay on the property you have permission for. Well, yeah, and, and that's the key, because in this matter, um, they actually had, the, the dog hunting club had three or 400 acres uh, down the road, and what the court, and, and the plaintiff had numerous times had asked them to stop letting your dogs out on my property. And they, they were, the plaintiffs were steel hunters and the, on numerous occasions, they, they were in the midst of getting ready to take a deer and then a pack of dogs came through and ran them out or they didn't have any deer um, because the dogs had run them out. Uh, so that you either need permission get a lease, do whatever you need to do, but you can't just run them across. In this matter, you can't just run them across private property. And there was evidence to show that uh, with the collars and the tracking collars that, that, that they knew that it was being placed on private property. And the message for private property owners is perhaps the courts might be a venue if, if they have a problem similar to this. In, in other I mean, counties, other it, places. Every, every, case every, fact, every fact case is different. That's right. Each case falls on its own. Uh, we're just merely bringing up the case uh, just to show that it's out there and it's a case of interest uh, to the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What about any other business? Oh, uh, wait a minute. Go ahead, uh, Ben. And So does it would it pertain if they're rabbit hunting or squirrel hunting, other kinds of dog hunting? Well, this, in this, in this case, it would. You can't you can't let your dogs out on this man's property. I don't care what you're hunting. It's, it's just specific to this one property, one piece of facts. This is not. This right. doesn't apply other places. Right. Yeah. One thing before we adjourn, Mr. Chairman, is I, if you guys remember, I told y'all on a matter here a while back about naming a uh, particular building in North Mississippi for a job.
gentleman and uh, you signed the uh, order did. earlier and uh, we just need to put that on record that we're going to uh, I'm going to submit that resolution uh, to do that to the legislature this week. And each one of these commissioners agrees to Yeah, so everybody was it goes to the legislature. We'll, yeah. It's bills and has already been introduced. Okay. Yeah. When I get this, I can move forward. Okay. And our next meeting is on Fe February the fifteenth. It, it is. It's fifteenth Feb Wednesday, the fifteenth at nine o'clock. Hang on, Miss Post. Oh, you mean eleventh hour resolution? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sure y'all remember we've been talking with Entergy. Mississippi Power, and some of the other utilities about provide, taking over power transmission within the parks. And we've got our pilot program ready to go at Buccaneer Mississippi Power. It's gonna take over all power transmission infrastructure. One thing they have asked for is a resolution from the commission authorizing uh, this takeover of the power transmission I prepared the resolution and we just need a vote and a signature. So moved. I second. I think it's and and it, the distribution. I hope you see a lot more of these type of resolutions yeah. that yeah. move forward. You want us to sign it, we're ready to go. Well, we've got a motion and a second. Yeah, I need to. All right, motion and a second. Is any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Good job. Hope you get the other supplies. Well, the power company man, I'm glad we got more fish. Our company you represent, is it still in there? Company I represent. I don't represent them anymore. Yeah, they still send me two checks on one. Mr. Chairman, before we adjourn, I might just take a minute to recognize Shannon Gillardi and her group with the U.S. Fire Service who have been our guests today. We appreciate them being here. Thank you all for coming. I think I heard Mayor Rhodes cover a motion. Did I hear you make it? To adjourn. Oh, <laughs> second. The motion to make it to adjourn is always in order. We stand adjourned. Second. Well, I got a second. I need to vote. Everybody proved it. Okay. We're adjourned.